This is the overview for 2 Timothy. Now, for 2 Timothy, the author is the Apostle Paul. It's got four chapters, 83 verses, and around 1,666 words. And in 2 Timothy, Paul will talk about the church's departure from the truth. And something interesting is Paul also calls out a lot of people in this small epistle. Let's look at some of those verses where he's actually name-dropping and calling people out. It says in 2 Timothy 1.15, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. See, he's talking a lot about the church's departure from the truth, and he's adding in a lot of names in there of people that uh, have a part in that. In 2 Timothy 2.17, it says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And then he mentions some guys from the Old Testament. In 2 Timothy 3.8, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so did, these also resist, so did these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So he's comparing these, these uh, false teachers to those guys in the Old Testament that withstood Moses, who resist the truth and have corrupt minds in their reprobate concerning the faith. And then he talks about in 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. He says in 2 Timothy 4.10, he calls out Demas. He says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having ishing ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So in every chapter, he called someone out and talked about, you know, the departure from the faith that was going on and did a lot of name dropping. Name dropping isn't really something I do. I mean, I feel like if anyone's name needs to be called out, then it's my name. I just don't feel like I'm up to par enough to really call someone's name out without being a huge hypocrite. But if anyone can do some name dropping, it's Paul. And I do believe that there are some guys out there that live it enough to call somebody's name out. And Paul's one of those people. But a big phrase that Paul uses in this book is the phrase, the, these two words, of God. You find that a lot in this epistle. And that reminds us how we need to get back to the things of God. For example, let me name off some. In, one in ver chapter 1 and verse 1, he says the will of God. In chapter 1 and verse 6, he talks about the gift of God. 1 and verse 8, the power of God. 2 and verse 9, the word of God. 2.19, the foundation of God. 3 and verse 4, lovers of God. 3.16, inspiration of God. 3.17, man of God. And something interesting, Timothy's name itself means worshiper of God. So, get back to the things of God. Now, a good theme, if you want a theme could be endure hardness as a soldier, even in a time of spiritual decline. You see, he's getting on to, he's, well, he's telling Timothy about the church's decline. So a good thing is to endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ, even during a time of decline. Historically, probably 65, around 65 to 68 A.D. for the writing, and doctrinally, well, let me give you some more historically. Doc, uh, historically, it, it was around 65 to 68 A.D. And pretty much Paul is just writing to Timothy about the, the church's departure from the faith and name dropping as he goes along. And, you know, this is more instruction to Timothy about pastoring. You know, Timothy is a young pastor, and Paul's 
writing him these epistles, giving him instructions and things like that. Now, doctrinally, the doctrinal application, this is an instruction manual on fighting the good fight of faith and the church's decline. And pretty much the same thing devotionally. The Christian life is tough, and the instructions in this small epistle will help you deal on a day-to-day -day basis how to act, what to do in this time of decline. Because if it was... If he was experiencing a decline back then, imagine what he's what we're experiencing now is way worse. But as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, the word is your weapon. And Paul's letters to Timothy are pastoral epistles. So it makes sense that each chapter has something about the word, the word of God itself. And here's a quick chapter outline to go along with that. Now, chapter one, if you want to outline Chapter 1, hold fast the word. And 2 Timothy 1, 13 says, hold fast the form of sound words. Chapter 2, teach and study the word. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So chapter 1, hold fast the word. Chapter 2, teach and study the word. And then chapter 3, suffer for the word. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So as you endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you're going to be suffering for the word. Chapter 4, Preach the word. It says in 2 Timothy 4 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So, chapter 1, hold fast the word. Chapter 2, teach and study the word. Chapter 3, suffer for the word. Chapter 4, preach the word. And with that being said, let's now dive into the book and just see what kind of adventure that it takes us on. Chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 5. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that's, that would be faith that's not pretend, it's real faith. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Notice uh, Paul calls to remembrance the good things about Timothy. And Timothy had been raised up a Bible believer or well, in a Bible believing family by Lois and Eunice. And it says in Second Timothy three fifteen, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. That's what he says to him. Obviously because of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And now, Timothy's been discipled by the Apostle Paul himself, so I'd say Timothy really knew the book. He's trying to raise, uh, he's, you see, his parents raised him up in a way that they wouldn't be ashamed. You know, they train up a child in the way, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he won't depart from it. And in 2 Timothy 1.8, it says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul's saying this to Timothy. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He doesn't want Timothy to be ashamed of the fact that his mentor is in prison for the faith. And Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'd say it wasn't a good look for your reputation with the world hanging out with Paul. Uh, they probably saw Paul as a fanatic and Timothy as one of his cult followers. And I think people were ashamed to be associated with Paul. And he was in and out of jail for preaching the book. And he says in 2 Timothy 1.16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He's constantly, he doesn't care to name drop, whether it be 
commending somebody or calling somebody out for something wrong that they've done. But Paul points out and recognizes his true recognize his true friends that aren't ashamed to be associated with him. You see, Paul and Timothy were tied. He even calls Timothy his son. In 2 Timothy 1 2, he says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. The way I see it is I can be associated with anybody, anywhere, anytime. You know, as long as they're a Christian trying to live right, I can just fellowship with that person all the time. Doesn't make a difference what they've done in the past. And it always amazes me when I see Christians who are afraid to let people know that they are friends with someone or that they like someone. I mean, if you're not a if you're not my friend because of who I'm friends with, then you were never really my friend anyway. But a lot of people are like that. If you're if you're friends with somebody that's got a bad reputation or something or somebody that is looked down on by a lot of Christians, then they'll just stop being your friend. But it says in 2 Timothy 1.10, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, Jesus Christ came down and lived a sinless life. Then he willingly offered himself on the cross just so he could go down to the heart of the earth, rise from the dead, and defeat it. He abolished death. And now if you put your trust in him, you will be immortal. Because the body, this body you have right now is going to die, but the one you're going to get will never die. 2 Timothy 1.13 Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy needs to hold fast the words that he learned as a child and the doctrines that, he, that the Apostle Paul taught him. Now chapter 2. This is about soldiers and the Lord's army, is what you're going to see in this chapter. 2 Timothy 2, 1, it says, thou, there, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Ephesians six ten says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, not in your own might, but in the Lord's might. 2 Timothy 2, and verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard, of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul wants Timothy to train up some more faithful men. This might take one-on-one -on -one instruction. I heard a pastor say one time that he didn't really know how to, to disciple people. I mean, but they, but that's what he needs to do as a pastor. You, you got to disciple people. One of those qualifications for holding an office was being apt to teach. And I hear a lot about how there's too much teaching going on and not enough preaching going on. Uh, maybe when it comes to the contemporary style churches, that could be true. Uh, but teaching Bible doctrine has become a lost art. I mean, if there is too much teaching going on, then how come nobody even knows anything about the Bible? If there's too much teaching going on, then how come nobody even knows what the second coming is? They don't know the difference between Jesus Christ coming back to get his saints and coming back with his saints. Uh, I'll talk about the second coming, possibly my favorite doctrine in the entire Bible, and people just kind of look at me like they don't really know what I'm talking about. I mean, that's the greatest doctrine in the Bible, and people, Christians, don't know anything about it really. Uh, they don't understand that Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse with all of his saints. They really don't know anything about that. They have no idea that there's going to be bloodshed and Jesus Christ is coming back to bring in his kingdom. It's become a lost art to teach Bible doctrine. If there's too much teaching going on, then how come the average Christian has never heard of a dispensation? How come they haven't ever heard of Bible typology? Go up to the average Christian and ask him to tell you some Bible types from the Old Testament. The average Christian has no idea that they can go through the Old Testament and find Jesus Christ on every single page. You see, teaching is what makes the Bible really come alive. And there's so many good preachers today. But the teaching has been put on the shelf. And I think the guy who doesn't know how to disciple people is a good preacher, but... I think they get so caught up and worried about making sure that 
maybe people are entertained and things like that, that they forget to give attendance to reading. You know, to really begin to dig in the Word, make people, make sure people know about the doctrines and of the Bible. But the best thing he could do is just get in the book himself, learn something new himself about the Word of God every single day of his life, and then just simply pass that on to his congregation. And if he does that, then he's never going to run out of stuff to preach or teach. It just keeps going and going and going because the Bible's a never-ending story. Once you open a door with this certain doctrine, there's like an infinite amount of other doors that you could walk through. It just keeps going and going. But you want to pass what you know down to all the people that you're feeding the Word of God to. Paul told Timothy, he's like, the same things that you've heard me teach you, commit those things to faithful men. And I'm not a pastor. I've never been a pastor. In my opinion, I don't think that I'm qualified to be a pastor or that I'll ever be one. So m m the, my opinions that I'm giving you right now, I mean, probably don't amount, m amount to much. But th I think it's a great idea to learn as much truth as you can every day. Fill your head with as much truth and Bible doctrines and facts as you can. And your goal should be to give that to the people that's coming to hear you every Sunday. So that guy said he don't know how to disciple people. Well, that's the best way to do it right there. And then do one-on-one -on -one time with that person. And it's not just learning the Bible, obviously, but I, I think that's the biggest part of it. Because if you can teach somebody the Bible... The other stuff's going to fall into place. But, I mean, I think a lot of the problem is, and like I said, this is my opinion, and I'm not a pastor. I've never been a pastor. I'll probably never be one because I don't believe I'm qualified to be one. But if all you do is read one verse and never go back to the Bible after that, you're not going to pass very much down to the people. Because you're just reading one verse and then kind of just you quit with the Bible after that and never go back to it again. That's not really committing things to them. Some of the best messages I've ever heard, there's been some, uh, the best I've ever heard are like that, where they read just one verse and never really go back to the Bible. But there's people that do that every single time. Every single time that they get up on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that's hard to teach the whole counsel of God to people when you do that. It's hard for them to grow when you do that. There's so much in the Bible that I literally stress myself out trying to get a lesson out on all of it. I'm constantly wanting to do this other series about this or this other series about that. And then there's another topic that comes up to mind and I want to do a lesson on that. And then I'll be in the middle of doing a verse by verse on this certain book of the Bible and all of a sudden I just want to start doing a verse by verse on Joshua or Ezekiel. Yeah, that's why I've got some books of the Bible that I didn't complete because in the middle of that one I just I just felt the need to go over and start doing the verse by verse on this one over here. And if I just got on here and just read one verse and then just talked for a while I'd never get anywhere. I wouldn't I wouldn't really be passing too much of the Word of God down to the people who are taking their precious time to listen. You see, time is a gift, and when people come to listen to you, you're, they're giving you pieces of their time. And like when somebody's logging on here to listen to me, I want to make sure that I'm putting out tons of Bible in a pretty short time frame like in a 30 minute time frame sometimes it goes over but i like to just give as much bible as much truth as i can in that 30 to 40 minute time frame because they're giving me a piece of their time that they can never get back you see when you are getting up every sunday and wednesday if you're a pastor you're giving all these people are coming and giving you a piece of their time and I know obviously they're they're doing it for God first and foremost. But that's also you that they're listening to. If people are going to listen to my boring voice on here, I want to at least give them some treasures to mark up their Bible with. 
You see, listening to preaching should be like going treasure hunting. So each time I hear a sermon, I listen for these little treasures that I can collect in my Bible. You see, some people put four-leaf clovers in, in their Bible. But I like to hear a good reference, a good thought, a good outline, or something to put in my treasure box. The Bible is my treasure box, my treasure chest. I'm, I'm trying to compile a treasure chest that I can feed on every day and feed others with endlessly. And that's why it's good to mark up your Bible or your notebook. You see, I used to, I used to listen to this preacher named Jack Kyles when I first got saved. He's got some great sermons, but it's not giving you very many treasures. That's just my opinion. I mean, they can inspire you. They can make you want to do certain things, things like that. You know, it, it can correct you and reprove you and instruct you. But a lot of his sermons, or most of his sermons, had no doctrine. You never heard him talk about the second coming the greatest doctrine in the Bible. I only remember him talking about the rapture a few times. And the Word of God is first profitable for doctrine. And back to that point, if there's too much teaching going on, then why has everyone forgot about doctrine? They don't know any doctrine. If there's teaching going on, then it's it's the type of teaching to where it's the same as a lot of preaching where they take one verse and then they just go on this rambling type thing like that. But, you know, it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's the first thing it mentioned, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If you don't know any doctrine to train the people you're feeding, then... The simple answer is just start learning it today. That doesn't mean you quit. Just get you a King James Bible. Get e-sword or a concordance. Search every word or phrase in a chapter and write it down. Write down your thoughts on it. If you don't feel comfortable enough doing that yet, then there's great books like The Great Doctrines of the Bible by William Evans or those books by Peter Ruckman called Theological Studies, or this great newer book by Kyle Stevens called Building Thereupon. And those will teach you just some of the basic Bible doctrine that has become completely lost today. And that will get you started. Like In that Kyle Stevens book, he goes over like the doctrines of salvation. For example, justification, imputation, propitiation, spiritual circumcision, all those great doctrines of salvation that sound like big intimidating words, but you just study them, you learn what they mean, and they show you what your salvation is. And those things, it's become a lost art to teach on these things. I've never just, I've never bide into this thing that there's too much teaching going on. I've heard so many preachers say that. In contemporary contemporary churches, I guess they do a lot of teaching, but they're not really teaching doc. They're not teaching doctrine. They aren't doing teaching or preaching. It's teaching on the home, being a better spouse, raising your kids, stuff like that. They're not teaching Bible doctrine. And most of the independent church Baptist churches, if you watch the services, it's great preaching, but it's preaching that makes the people fall in love with good preaching and not fall in love with the Word of God. You see, you know that you got some good teaching going on when those people in that church are in love with the Word of God and not just good preaching. And once again, that's my opinion, and I wouldn't be mad if you disagreed because, you know, who am I? I'm a nobody. But doctrine is what makes the Bible come alive, and teaching doctrine has definitely become a lost art. There's all types of good preaching out there. But it's very rare that you find somebody that's a good teacher that makes you fall in love with the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.3 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There is more to being in this than just learning doctrine. 
And every day you face something that's hard. It may not even be something spiritual. Just because we have it made compared to people 200 years ago, it doesn't change the fact that you have it hard as well. Just because you aren't walking to work and to school doesn't mean you don't have it hard. It's harder to live right now than it's ever been, probably. I mean, there's temptations everywhere you turn. Work is hard. People are working overtime like crazy nowadays. The old-timers were hard workers. They were working six days a week, but they closed down on Sundays back then. I mean, as far as I know, that's what I've always heard. My grandparents used to tell me they, people didn't have to work on Sundays. They closed everything down on Sundays. But the thing is, you got guys today where I work that work seven days a week, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16-hour days. There was a time in my life where I was, where I would work a 20-hour shift, 20 hours at least once a week, and 13, 16-hour shifts the other days of the week. It, I mean, it's like Pharaoh is in the factories. Uh, just about anywhere you go nowadays, I mean, the average worker, factory worker, just about anywhere you go, you're going to eventually get a six to seven days a week. You're lucky if they don't. And a lot of guys leave one place, they leave one workplace, because this other place is offering good benefits and days off, but then eventually this new workplace will eventually go to a six to seven day work week. Or the 12 to 14 hour shifts, five, six, five to six days a week. And these aren't office jobs. These are break your back type of jobs, 100 plus degree temperature type of jobs. Jobs where they don't want you to leave the line to go to the restroom. You know, life is hard. You have to endure hardness, not just in your spiritual life, but in your physical life. You have to endure hardness in your spiritual life. You have to be like a soldier. And when I'm working and I get tired, I think about these verses. I'm, I'm definitely not a soldier. I'd, I'd probably never make it in the army. But you can be a soldier in the Lord's army. Even if you've lost all the energy in your body, you could be a soldier in the Lord's army. And it says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If you're saved, the Lord's chosen you to be a soldier. Even if you're in a wheelchair, even if you're 80 years old, 90 years old, and can barely do any physical things anymore, you've been chosen to be a soldier. The moment you got saved, you were chosen to be a soldier, and you're going to go through tough times. And in this army, your main mission is to please Jesus Christ. It says in Colossians 1.10 that you might walk, wor walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In 2 Timothy 2, 5, it says, And if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. See, in this war, this race, you have to strive lawfully, no cheating. you got to go back to the book. you got to go by the rule book. If you don't go back to the book and you do it your own way, you don't get a crown. You may have the right motive. You may be sincere. You may do some good, but you got to do it lawfully. you got to go by the book. It says in 2 Timothy 2.12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Talking about the reign. He'll deny you the reign, not your salvation. But if you don't suffer with him, you get denied the, sal the, the reign, not the salvation. The good thing about suffering is that if you suffer... It gives you a chance to earn stuff. For example, if you're going to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and suffer, what a lot of people don't understand is uh, when they see you pull up in a new car or you got a new house, you got clothes that don't look like you just rolled out of the bed, you got food in the fridge, you got a hot wife, whatever, what they don't realize is you did some suffering to get that stuff that's the physical stuff i mean you had to do some suffering to get that stuff i mean they think these people they think they should be able to have all that stuff even though when the alarm goes off at 4 a.m 
or if they even set an alarm, they hit the snooze button and call into work that day. You see, they don't want to do any suffering. They don't want to persevere. And they got the nerve to look you in the eye or say it behind your back. Uh, they got the nerve to say, must be nice to have that car. Must be nice to have that house. Must be nice to have that wife, those clothes. And that's that's stupid. And and if I was as stupid as they were, I could look at I could look back at them and say, must be nice to sleep in all day. Must be nice to stay up all night and watch Netflix. Must be nice to live off the government when you could work yourself. Must be nice to have your your did not have to give your kids a bath every night and just let them walk around smelling like cigarettes and their own hind end. I mean, it, it must be nice to do all those things. You see, I've come to hate the phrase, must be nice. When I, when I hear somebody say that phrase, it just drives me crazy. I think that phrase, not every time, but many times, is associated with envy. Somebody being envious of you. When they see you got something good going on in your life, and they say, must be nice, that automatically lets me know, well, they're not happy for me. They're mad because they don't have what I have. And I'm sure there are exceptions to that, but the people that usually say it are the ones who think they are above suffering. If you suffer, you're going to reign. If you suffer for the Lord, you're going to have something in the millennium. And just like if you suffer in this life, at least in this country in 2022, if you go to work every day and do some suffering, you're they're going to have some evidence of that suffering. You're going to have something. When the envious neighbor sees the stuff you have, he just sees the stuff. He just sees the car. He just sees the house. He just sees the wife. He just sees the clothes. He doesn't see you getting up at 4 a.m. He doesn't see you having to go to bed early. You see, when he, when you go to bed at 4, or when you get up at 4, he's still asleep for probably 6 or 7 more hours after that. Uh, when you go to bed early and sacrifice doing some things that you would like to stay up and do he's staying up all night he doesn't see you bathing the kids he just lets his kids smell like onions uh, he doesn't see you helping them with their homework he probably doesn't even check to see if they got homework he doesn't see you changing diapers you know he probably lets his kids get diaper rash He's probably like that woman on the... He probably goes by that one uh, woman's philosophy I seen on the news where she said, you need to ask your baby permission to change his diaper first. That's probably how he thinks. Uh, he doesn't see you dealing with disciplining the kids. He doesn't see a list that is about 20 feet long of what you have to do that day. All he sees is him, himself, his Cheetos, and his beanbag. He doesn't see the suffering that you're doing. He just sees the envy in his face that he has for you. It says in 2 Timothy 2.13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. It's funny to me how these guys go around and say everyone is lost because they don't believe. When this verse says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You see... You believe, if there was a time when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're saved and nothing can change that. Now, anybody who dies without ever believing on Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. No doubt about it. If you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. But there are people who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like, really believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just saying a a quick prayer to get somebody off their back, but they sincerely believe from the heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved, even if something down the road makes them question God or doubt God or not be a Bible believer anymore. Even if that happens, this verse says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So the verse says, if we believe not, he abideth faithful, he cannot he can't deny himself. If God will keep me, even though I quit believing... I don't think there's anything I could believe wrong and him not keep me. You see all these people going around saying, well, you're lost because you don't believe this doctrine or that doctrine. If God takes it as far as keeping me saved, even if I quit believing in him, 
I don't think there's anything that you could believe that would make you lost. <clears throat> like I said, I'm all about doctrine. I'm all about teaching the right doctrine. If somebody denies the Trinity and all these things, you know, I'm going to separate from that person, at least when it comes to listening to them teach the Bible or whatever. But uh, just because somebody begin believing wrong about the Trinity or something like that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're lost. Maybe they are lost. I mean, I can't see their heart. But if God's willing to keep you saved, even if you quit believing entirely, I don't think there's anything that you could believe or not believe that would make you lose your salvation or not be saved. This, because if there was a time when you believed the gospel, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved, and there's nothing anybody can do about that. So all them guys that want to go around and say, if you believe in dispensational salvations, then you're lost, or you are a reprobate, or whatever. You see, first off, they don't even know what dispensational salvation is, those guys that say that. Another thing, if, if God will still keep you when you lost faith in Him, He'll keep you through anything. You see, he can't deny himself. You became a part of him when you got saved. You became bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he came and took up residence in you. He can't deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul is telling Timothy to study. And I don't know if you remember, but last time we saw how one of the qualifications for the guy holding the office of a pastor was that he needs to be apt to teach. And if you're going to teach something, then you're going to have to study to do that. And it takes a lot of time. It takes so much time just to do what I'm doing. Put out all these lessons, these verse-by-verse -verse studies, these overviews of a whole book. And the multitasking multitasking it is a key and if you're like me then you have a full-time job that requires overtime i'm work i was working a double shift as i put this study together i'm and i'm multitask taxed the whole time you see using your breaks at work to put something together is key uh, while you're working thinking about the lesson is key maybe even listening to something on your headphones about what you're wanting to teach is a key. Getting up early in the morning about an hour, an hour and a half before work starts is a key. You see, this gives you an hour and a half of study time. And if you do that every day, if you imagine if you got up an hour and a half early every day just to study. If you do that every day, it's going to give you almost eight hours of study time extra Monday through Friday. That's a long time. And if you're a single person and you don't have to work that much, I mean, you could cram your head full of Bible knowledge for a few years and be on another level than most guys. I mean, I remember uh, when I got saved for about two years before I got married, and I crammed all those two years before my life just really took this turn of busyness. I crammed all those two years. I was eating the Bible like candy. I was going through commentaries like Skittles, verse-by-verse -verse studies like it was just M&Ms. I mean, you think you're in a bad situation as a single person, but when you're single, the opportunity is there for you to study and cram your mind full of doctrine because there may be a time in the future when you're married, you got kids, you got this crazy job requiring all these hours, and it can be hard to study as much. But the only difference for me now is I may not have as much time as I used to, but now I know how to get things studied faster and easier and organize it better. See, I had a lot more time on my hands as a younger single person, not working as much. But now I have more experience and I can get things studied faster. I can get answers faster. I know where I know where to go in my Bible to get the answers. I know the resources to get answers faster. I mean, you just want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more you read the Bible, the more you study the Bible, you're just going to be quicker. You're, you'll get faster and faster all the time with putting things together, studying a thing out. Your comprehension will be way better. So it, it'll balance out eventually. 
but use this time now as a single person to really cram your mind. And you need to stay hungry for the Word. You see, I've never lost that hunger for the Word since I got saved. I'm not saying it won't happen or couldn't happen. But once you stop feeding on the Word, you quit growing. When you get saved, you're like a lizard because you can just keep growing as long as you live. As long as you live in the Word, you just keep on growing and growing and growing. If you quit living in the Word, then you just stunt your growth. It says in 2 Timothy 2.16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So that ungodly thing can lead to more ungodliness. And this has to do with the philosophy of the world, that profane and vain babblings. They just spew out these profane and vain junk. I mean, they talk for an hour, and it sounds really smart, but they really never say anything. But it says about their words in verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom as Hymenaeus and Philetus. You see, words are weapons. Uh, their words are eating as doth a canker. And they, they have this saying that says, Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Actually, they can hurt you if you let them or you're not prepared for them. Words can make you get bitter, and, and then the bitterness eats your bones. Uh, words can play over in your mind until you psych yourself out into a rage. Uh, smooth words from a, a false prophet can cause you to stumble and to be led astray. It is the smooth words of philosophy and TV preachers and atheists and celebrities and the like that can get in you, you see. And just like you hide the Word of God in your heart, you can also hide the words of the world in your heart. It says in 2 Timothy 2.18, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. This Hymenaeus and Philetus said the resurrection has passed already, and this overthrew, notice that overthrew the face of, faith of some. You see, a lot of saints... Were paddling along in their canoe, trying to finish their course with joy, and these two guys came out of the water, this Hymenaeus and Philetus, and overthrew their canoe. They just tipped it right over. But see, if those guys would have had their canoe loaded down with the words of God, then it would have been too heavy for those two guys to lift and turn their canoe over. They would have had to move on to somebody else. You see, you just got to keep loading your canoe down with the word of God faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God it's going to be hard for somebody to to take down your faith when you have, have loaded your canoe down with so much of the word of God that you've heard now chapter 3 2 Timothy 3 1 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come you see we know that tribula the tribulation will be bad but the last days of the church age will also be bad and here's some characteristics of those days. It says in verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. But look at that one, lovers of their own selves. I mean, have you ever heard the saying, love yourself first, or look out for old number one, or if you don't care, if you don't care about yourself, nobody else will, and you know, all of these sayings like that. All these sayings are anti-Bible. Have you heard the saying, you know, you have to worry about you or you have to make yourself happy or uh, things like that. You'll never be happy trying to make yourself happy, though. You see, that's what everybody's trying to do. They're trying to make their self happy, but they're miserable. You see, there will always be something missing when you just go around trying to make yourself happy. Your focus actually should be on pleasing the Lord first pleasing other people second and then pleasing yourself dead last so love yourself last here's you some good sayings not love yourself first love yourself last uh, look out for everyone before you not look out for number one or if you don't take care of yourself first then believe god will take care of you while you take care of others make others happy and on your road of doing that you don't have to worry about taking care of yourself god will take care of you so there's some new sayings for you. But next we have that, that word covetous, a sign of the perilous, a sign of uh, being in perilous times as people are 
extremely covetous. You see, they want your house. They want your wife. They want your truck. They want your zero-turn lawnmower, your tool shed, your life, and your soul. They want it all. I mean, if your wife's dressed up looking good, not immodestly, but just looking good, you know, you got a good-looking wife or something, uh, walk through the mall with her. All the other men's going to be staring at her. They want your wife, you see. Uh, they want your truck. If they don't have your truck, they're jealous. Or not jealous, but envious. You see, that's, they're coveting. Uh, it also means they're idolaters. If you had all this stuff, you know, if you got all this great stuff that you see other people with, like if you traded lives with them and they took your stuff and you took theirs, you're just going to start coveting the stuff that you used to have. You think the grass is greener on the other side, but really it's just as dead and ugly over there as it is on your side. But next, another trait is boasters and the proud. You see, men love to toot their own horn. They love to ha play for bragging rights. You see, when someone, um, when someone has this boasting and proud disease, it just seeps out the pores on their face. They start to have this condition where their chin just sticks up in the air when they walk another one of this last days another one of these last days traits is people will be disobedient to parents the kids will be disobedient to parents you see are you one of those parents that can uh hit your kid with a hickory switch and they just get up and laugh at you like some type of mutant i can feel your pain don't feel too bad i mean we are in the last days. And one of the last days signs is kids are disobedient to parents. And I don't know if the devil's put something in the cereal or in the fruit roll-ups. But when I was a kid, it just didn't work how it's working right now. Uh, when my when my papa got the belt on me and hit me a few times, I laid lifeless in the floor for a few minutes when I was a real little kid. I didn't get up and laugh and try to be tough. You see, ignore all the parent shamers who say things like, you know, you really need to make your child mind and discipline them. I'm thinking, what do you think I'm doing? You see, they don't know that the struggle is real. I mean, you can only beat the kids so much before it's considered child abuse, right? I mean, they have a free will. Sometimes you can spank and paddle and swat and take away toys and they just get up and bark at you like some devil-possessed chihuahua. I mean, ignore all the people out there saying that you're not spanking hard enough. You don't know how many. T you don't know how hard somebody's spanking their kid. I mean, how many times have you heard that? I mean, we are living in the last days of the church. They can take a hit like Rocky Balboa going up against Drago. I mean. They must play the eye of the tiger in their head when you got the belt on them. Because, I mean, they're just too tough for their own good. Did you know being tough can actually be a bad thing? You don't want to be so tough that a good whipping doesn't humble you. I mean, the Lord would pull out the whip on Israel and they'd get up and laugh about it. So, in Isaiah 1.5, the Lord says, Why should you be stricken anymore? you will revolt more and more. You see, the Lord's whippings on Israel weren't doing any good. They were so rebellious and full of the devil, they would take the paddle from the Lord, the chastening from the Lord, and just jump up and do the same thing again. So he's like, why should you be stricken anymore? You're just going to do it all over again. I'm not even going to whip you anymore. I was kind of like that in my teenage years. I'd get in trouble for skipping class, get sent to the principal, and nothing that he said would faze me. I'd kind of just sit there and not say anything. And, you know, a lot of people would get in trouble for talking, but I'd get in trouble for not talking. But the principal, he had this big wooden paddle with holes in it, I guess so the air would go through it and he could swing it faster. And he would literally come up off the ground as he came down on your backside with that thing. And I would never give him the satisfaction of seeing me in pain. And after it was over, I'd put my wallet back in my back pocket and walk out like nothing happened all mysterious-like, just to mess with him. But it got to a point where 
Uh, they didn't even paddle me. They just put me in the cubicle, in a cubicle somewhere by myself. And, you know, it, that's kind of like what God will do. You know, he's like, why should you be stricken anymore? You know, the whip's not working anymore. So we're going to have to try something else. Maybe the Lord will just leave you alone for a while. You know, did you know it actually could be a judgment from God for him to leave you alone and not chasing you? You know, that can be a bad thing to go unchecked. You know, just keep sinning and nothing ever chin checks you, puts you back in line. But sometimes you can be spanked by the world's strongest man on steroids a kid can be spanked that hard and the kid just going to get back up guns blazing like nothing ever happened. And it's not doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad parent. It means that it's the signs of the times that we're living in. The last days of the church, one of the signs is kids are disobedient to parents. So, as a word of encouragement, when you're out eating with the family and some Karen at Applebee's or Texas Roadhouse gives you the evil eye because your kid just went full on ape and ate those blooming onions like like they're going out of style got them all over his face all over the floor and just blew bubbles in his water for 10 minutes just remember it isn't all your parenting it's a sign of the last days before the rapture kids are just wilding out today but another one without natural affection second timothy 3 3 a sign is with people are without natural affection. That's a big one, a big, big one. Because that includes the sodomites. It's not natural for a man to kiss another man in the mouth. I mean, they're greeting one another with an unholy kiss. You know, when God said, love your brother, I don't think he meant like that. But I mean, I got a happy meal at McDonald's the other day. Not for me, it was for my daughter. Although I did eat a lot of the fries. But I was looking at that happy meal box thing. And it had two dads on it. And my daughter's the one that noticed it, actually, before I did. But what you have is a bunch of rich, big-shot perverts in this world who are wanting to come at your kids when they're young and impressionable and indoctrinate them. They want their own little homo, lesbo, pedo, Atlantis utopia on this world. They want to live in a world where you just do what feels right, but they don't realize what's going to happen when things get so bad that Man gets more and more depraved that things like necrophilia feels right or bestiality feels right or murder rapes feel right. You see, for a lot of men, that wicked stuff feels right. But you can't live by how you feel. You have to get the Bible as your final authority and live by that, go by that. You see, a mother that doesn't want her child doesn't have natural affection as well. Uh, a sodomite doesn't have natural affection. Somebody like Ted Bundy, who is into the murder-rape stuff, that's not natural affection. But a mother that doesn't want her child, that's, that's not natural affection. How could a woman, you know, carry around a person in her body for nine months, birth them, and then not love the baby? You see, that's unnatural, not to love your child. But that's what you have nowadays. If you're a mom that's trying your best with the kids, trying to take care of the kids, bathing them, feeding them, getting them up for school in the morning, then you're a good mom, no matter what anybody says, even if the kids are full of the devil. Because what you have today is parents that don't even want to fool with the kids, period, let alone give them a bath, let alone provide them with food and a place to live. Another one is, another sign of the last days of the church is despisers of those that are good. And, you know, I say signs... Loosely, because, you know, we're not looking for signs of the rapture. You know, the rapture could happen any minute. You know, the Jews are the ones that require a sign. In 1 Corinthians one twenty two it says, but at the same time, we've got, you know, characteristics of things that show us that, you know, we're getting closer and closer. But we're living in a world that calls evil good and good evil. We're living in a world of despisers of those that are good. They're trying to rewire the brains of people to think backwards like that. They want you to think godly people are the enemy and that perverts of this world, the ones without natural affection, they want you to think that those are your sweet, huggable, 
friendly neighborhood sissy man. They want you to think the little boy lover is a good candidate to have for story time at the library and for babysitting and for substitute teaching. And if you're against that homo stuff, they call you homophobic and a hater and all these other things. You see, the villain would love to frame the good guys as the bad guys. So you have despisers of those that are good. If you stand up for the Bible and what's right, the world's not going to like you. But in verse 4, it says, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Don't trade in the book for entertainment. Don't trade it in for pleasures of the world. If you get in the book, then you're going to think the book's entertaining. I'm to the point where the only thing that satisfies me is the book. It's not just a Sunday thing for me. It's not just a... Uh, Wednesday night thing for me. It's a way of life thing. I've I've not done all I should do, and I still don't do all I should do, and I get overwhelmed with work and with family and all the stuff that I have to do, and I get backslid and everything, but I'm to the point where the book has become my walk and my talk and just a part of me. Even in my most backslid state, I still read 10 chapters a day uh, and study for a long time. I mean, it's not bragging, I mean, I'm I'm sorry and I'll, almost everything else, but if it wasn't for the Bible, I would be a mean person. And many times, if it's the only thing that kept me from just flying off the handle, going crazy, and being just like I used to be. But never start loving the pleasurable things of life more than you do the Bible. But it says in verse 5, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. If I go over all these characteristics, then we will never get done. I've done went way longer than I like to, but there are people out there who are ever learning, and they never come to the knowledge of the truth. They can't ever get the gospel down they've heard it they've rejected it they have no knowledge of it whatsoever so do the opposite you have the knowledge of the truth you've been saved you know the gospel so be ever learning when it comes to the truth they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth so you need to be ever learning when it comes to the truth there shouldn't be a day that goes by that you don't learn some new truth I mean, you see, you're always forgetting something that you learned five years ago. So if you don't want to get dumber and dumber, then you have to replace what you forget with something new. So learn something new every day. And it says in verse 12, Yea, and all that live godly, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It doesn't have to be getting your head chopped off either. It can be as simple as someone mocking you. I mean, it says Ishmael persecuted Isaac. And all he did was mock him. He didn't chop his head off. And that was still considered persecution. Uh, someone making fun of your eternal security belief is persecution. When someone puts you down for believing that you're saved and kept saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And only Jesus Christ is what's saving you and keeping you saved. When they put you down for believing that, that is considered persecution. You see, when Paul was going around preaching saved by grace through faith without works and the finished work of Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Uh, Galatians 5.11 says, And I, brethren, Paul says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. And he's basically saying, you know, if I go around and, if I'm going around preaching circumcision as a way of salvation, then why am I being persecuted? Pretty much, you know, I'm being persecuted because I'm preaching salvation by grace through faith without works that's what he's saying paul's basically saying if he taught circumcision for salvation and all these other works for salvation then he wouldn't be being persecuted like he was when your flesh rises up and wants to do wicked and you have temptations from all sides making your flesh rise up that's a form of persecution you see you, there's more persecution going on than you think there is 2 Timothy 3.13 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The more time goes, the more wicked man will get. Things don't get better, they get worse. And this is how you know the post-millennial guys are wrong. You see, they believe the church will make things better and better until we bring in the kingdom. 
that's wrong. Things actually get worse and worse, and they don't get better until Jesus Christ brings in the kingdom itself. Things are going to get a lot worse before it gets better because evil men and seducers show acts worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. People are deceiving and being deceived. They think they got all the answers. They think they can tell you the best way to live. They think there are many gods or more than one way to heaven. They are way off. There's only one way. I just heard this famous singer the other day saying, you know, we all have our own gods. And he said, what I've experienced has just made my faith stronger in the God that I believe in. That all sounds good to the unsaved world, but if you have any lick of Bible sense, then you know that's a whole pack of baloney. Without the skin cut off the sides, it's just baloney. It, that's just fake nonsense. That's the wisdom of this world. He said the stuff he's going through makes his faith stronger in the God that he believes in. But that amounts to nothing because there's only one way, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, any other way that you're trying to get to heaven or wherever it is you think you're going when you die, any way outside of Jesus Christ is going to put you in one place, and that's hell. Second Timothy 3.15, and that from a child, Paul's telling Timothy, he said, from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had a good grandmother named Lois and a good mother named Eunice. They trained up a child in the way he should go. They trained him up in the word. And if you do that, and keep planting the word in their heart, even if they stray off from the Lord and from you, they will always have that biblical voice in the back of their head that's tugging at them. Verse 16, Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. See, every bit of the book is good use. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. They were our examples. The scriptures given by inspiration. And Peter said, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then the Lord preserved the scriptures. You see, inspiration without preservation is meaningless. The word was preserved all through our history, and you have it in your lap. Verse 17, That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. The word of God is what equips you. It makes you thoroughly furnished. That's throughly and not thoroughly. It's throughly because it goes through you. It furnished you just like they furnished the tabernacle in the Old Testament. But now today, your body's the temple. And when you read the Word, it's like you're putting your furniture in there. You're making it a comfortable place for the Holy Spirit to indwell. And if you're not reading the Word, then you're just not giving Him a good place to indwell. You're... you're Feng Shui ain't right. You got the Holy Spirit sitting on the cold floor. You got him sitting on cardboard. So you need to furnish. Use the Word of God. Furnish it up in there. Chapter 4. 2 Timothy 2, chapter 4, and verse 2 says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, reprove, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Paul tells Timothy to preach the word. Now, how could Timothy preach the word if he didn't have the word? He tells him to preach the word, not his opinion. He tells him to be instant in season and out of season. That is, when it's popular and when it ain't popular. In some places, you can go and proclaim that the King James Bible is the word of God and people just eat it up. Then you go to another place and do the same and the people try to eat you up. You see, you have to stick with the truth when it's popular, when it's not popular. He said, reprove, that is, put people in check for their actions. He said, rebuke, that is, put people in check for their actions with a little more tone and authority behind it. He said, exhort, that is, to put some fire in somebody so that they would do what the Lord would have them to do. And you do all these with all long-suffering and doctrine. You do it with long-suffering because it takes some people a while to get a hold of what you're saying. So you've got to be long-suffering. You do it with the doctrine because you just don't want to be all about do's and don'ts. And the Word of God is first and foremost profitable for doctrine. You have to do it with doctrine because if people don't know doctrine, they're just going to be led astray. And 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You see, some people don't want to hear sound doctrine because doctrine divides. And when you 
preach and teach doctrine, you have authority behind what you're saying because you're teaching things that are absolutes. Uh, you got to teach absolute truth. And people do not like absolute truth. Like proclaiming that it's either heaven or hell. Up or down. Right or wrong. Sh straight and not straight. You know, they don't like absolutes. They don't, they don't even like man and woman anymore. But you're either a man or you're a woman. You are what God made you. People don't like absolute stuff. They don't like you calling it like it is. People don't like authority or narrowing things down. They want everything loose and wide open. They want it to be okay to worship another Jesus. For this reason, you have men teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And people don't want to endure sound doctrine anymore. But this is Paul's farewell letter to Timothy. And he's trying to really nail this stuff down in his mind before he is martyred because he knew he was about to be martyred. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul was confident that he would get a crown. Not only was he confident in his salvation, but he was confident that he would get rewards at the judgment seat. You know, I'm confident that I'm saved, but I've always been unsure about whether I'm going to get anything at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, I'm constantly praying that I've got the right motive in what I do for God and that I'm working enough for God, but I've never been as sure as Paul was. Second Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Demas loved the present world and got called out for it. And 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. See, when you start loving uh, the present world, remember that this present world got flooded back in Genesis. And it's going to be burned in the future. But your eternal home is never going to grow old or wear out. Paul says in verse 11, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Luke went around with Paul. He could have doctored him up because Luke is the beloved physician. That's one of the ways you know Paul didn't keep those healing gifts that he used to have because he carried a, a beloved physician around with him. And remember that the contention at one time was so sharp between Mark and Paul that they broke fellowship for a time, but now they're reconciled. That's why he says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. There was one time where Paul didn't have anything to do with Mark, but they reconciled. And he says, Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. See, Paul was about to be offered, but he still wanted to read and write. So he says, bring the books and the parchments. Then he's calling somebody out here. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. God doesn't just reward you for good deeds, but he'll also give a man what he deserves for his evil deeds. He's going to reward this guy according to his works. And Paul says, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. You see, some people have to be talked about openly in a negative way to get people to be aware of them. If someone is hindering the work of spreading the words of God or the gospel, then you need to warn others to beware of that person. Paul says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Just like the angel shut the lion's mouth so that the, they couldn't get debt to Daniel, that's what the Lord did for Paul. God will go with you into the den, den of lions. But that's the overview for 2 Timothy. Hopefully, I won't go as long for Titus. If you've made it this long through this study, then congratulations.